application to the ADBCs. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. It's a bundle D2, tab 55, page 182 to 183. The passage starts at the top of page 182. Question. The position taken by your former solicitors is that the clients, my clients, and indeed your clients had signed off on the information annex 1A, that's right, isn't it? Answer correct. Presuming the position taken by them was on instructions from you, correct. Uh, how did uh, that position come to be taken on instructions from you? His Lordship, is that a matter of privilege? If it is, and then Mr. Brindle gets up, yes, my Lord, the form of the question is privilege. I'm sure it could be rephrased without endangering. Mr. Hill, I'll try again. Thank you, my Lord, you're quite right. And then I put the question again. You must have been aware, weren't you? This position was being taken. You must have been aware from this position that this position was untrue. And then Mr. Warlier says, "No, as far as Baker and McKenzie is concerned, this matter was being handled by the bank legal team in Zurich. So I'm not really aware of what discussions were being had there." So, perhaps prompted by Mr. Brindle, this is actually an example of Mr. Warlier trying to change his evidence. Uh, then I then I say, "But the instructions would have come from you, wouldn't they?" Answer, it wouldn't have come from me, it would have come from a legal team in the bank. Uh, question, I don't want to go into discussions with your lawyers. His Lordship, he's already told me with that the position taken was inst on instructions from him. That's what I thought. So he did accept it, uh, although it's right to say this was another example of him trying to um, reverse tack in his evidence. Obviously hard to see how lawyers in Zurich are going to take a position otherwise than on instructions. <coughs> so we were <coughs> going to go to the AGBCs. Uh, it's worth just reminding oneself of the state of the documents <coughs> both before and after. We've seen them a lot, but it's at tabs 1, 2, H1, 1, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 2. And starting with tab 121, as we all know, <coughs> in the forms, as they were sent back, one only had the typed name, the date, and the signature. Hang on a moment. 121A, are we on? Yes. Yeah. One had the typed name. Sorry, I'm just yeah. going back to that extract yeah. from the transcript. Yes. Yeah. The document was returned to Dubai, was it? I mean, it's a bank, Saracen, Alpin yes. document. Yes. So why were the bank's legal team in Zurich involved in <coughs> Well, what we were on was the Baker and McKenzie... I'm sorry, I went too fast. What we were on was the Baker and McKenzie letter, where they Baker were... Baker and McKenzie yeah. were retained by were retained by D1. It's entirely my point, I went too fast. First defendant had retained Baker and McKenzie. Right. Uh, and D2. Baker and McKenzie had taken the position that the sign, the forms were filled in and signed by us. Right. Uh, I had asked this, that was a false position. And that was the, the position that was in danger of derailing our entire claim. Right. But for the fact we had the form from the post-it right. time and we had to. I know, know, my question is certainly directed. Mr. Walia was saying, well, this is something that was being dealt with in Switzerland. I think what he was talking about well, why? Be, be, I think what he was saying is because it was a response to our letter before claim. He was saying, my lord, that Baker and McKenzie were getting their instructions from the Swiss lawyers. He says that. Whether it is indirectly from him is something my own friend making submissions about. But he says that was the, me the means of communication. Baker and McKenzie, that's what, why I asked that question to be read. Very early days, long before my structure sisters came on So obviously, the chain of lawyers. So again, I'm, uh, so Saracen Alpha had instructed Swiss lawyers. Well, that's what appears to be being yeah. said. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Learner from Mr. Brindle seems to be confirming it. Yeah. Right. Um, so my submission is that it was just a classic example of Mr. Wiley yeah. evading and being. Giving untrue evidence. Anyway, sorry, I, I just couldn't quite see the connection between the first defendant and, and 
Swiss lawyers. Well, there isn't a natural. Well, in, in the early, very early days of this, both Bank Saracen and Bank Saracen Alpin were received the letter of complaint. Yes. And in the first instance, they they employed Baker and McKenzie in Switzerland. For each, of that they, Baker and McKenzie were retained by both. Both. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But either way, fair to Mr. Wiley, given the accusations made, that that point was made. But either way, obviously, lawyers act on instructions. And Mr. Wiley had yes, I, 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 instructions. I, 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 I was only puzzled, that's all. Thank you. So we're back on the forms. Yes. H1121. Uh, uh, as we now know, the, they were, uh, the names were filled in on page one. But when we get to page six at the bottom, which is the first page of the Annex One, there's no box ticked yeah. in relation to Annex One, and none of the material is filled in for the individual client analysis at Annex One A that starts at page nine and ten. And then in the filled in version, which is at, starts at one, two, two, the uh, box is ticked. We can see that at page 6381, but not by my clients. And uh, the Annex 1A has been filled in. And, uh, and indeed, the document has been countersigned. And the document has been countersigned, exactly. On the same date. Well, that was another of the points I cross examined on. Yeah. That was one of the examples that we suggested showed a fairly careless approach on the Saracen Alpin side to back dating. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I may come back to that if I have time. Now, paragraph 268 of the judgment uh, summarizes the errors on the forms that were completed. Uh, and one needs 268. So I'm not sure I've actually read the man. Well, I've tried to read the manuscript entries. Do I need to have read them now, or is that? Because they're almost impossible to read. They were set out. Uh, they may be set out in the truck. Can we do the judgment? Exactly. Oh, right, okay. Two, three, two. I'm grateful for that. Two, three, two. grotesque example of the financial uh, status information being wrong uh, also explains her position at uh, paragraph 271.
And uh, the judge accepted the evidence of, given on this aspect by the claimants, which you'll see that acceptance at paragraph 276. I'm a learned friend in his submissions. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Mr. Frindle rather said that uh, the judge hasn't grappled with the material as deployed in uh, paragraph 273 and following. But you're probably coming to that. That's the point I need to come back to right. on the question of should they have qualified as right. clients. Okay. I think even Mr. Brindle isn't trying to suggest that those bits of information justified the material on the form. I think there's no suggestion that the material in the form was, was accurate, yeah. and that's an impossible suggestion. The material in the form was grossly inaccurate. This material comes back to the later question of should they have qualified as clients right. anyway, which, yeah. which I'll come to. So what one actually has with the forms is a, a very uh, alarmingly shoddy piece of box ticking, which just assumes or invents, or at the very least wildly exaggerates information about the defendants. Now, Mr. Tom. But it also has the unfortunate uh, appearance of having been written in the first person. That's exactly right. Uh, my grandfather, yes. my CFO, yes, uh, and so on. And again, one has to remember how this document was deployed by Great Crimea Kennedy. You were facing a suggestion that he had said all these things, because that's exactly what the document appears to suggest. Right. And it's, it is, in that respect, a thoroughly deceptive document. And. Mr. Taha gave evidence that he was not responsible for the false information that appears on these documents and its content. And that was not challenged, as the judge records at paragraphs 190 and 191. So it didn't come from Mr. Taha. It didn't come from the claimants who were disavowing its accuracy. And in any event, no one at, Bank Saras at Saracen Alpen had ever met two of the claimants. Mr. Walia gave evidence that Mr. Nair must have ticked the box and filled it in on the basis of information from the claimants. But when he was tested on this area, it transpired this was all speculation and he had no basis for saying that at all. And that is, I was already taken by laws to some of that transcript this morning, and that was uh, explained and, and findings were made on that point of a judgment at paragraphs 188 and 189. And we've never had any other or better explanation. Uh, and uh, in relation to the uh, third claimant, the uh, <coughs> evidence is recorded by the judge and the, his findings are recorded at paragraphs 214 and 15 and then 216 to 18. And as the judge records, there again, wholly inaccurate information and no reliable explanation as to how it came to be prepared. Uh, <clears throat> and the judge... And the judge... Uh, rightly concluded in paragraph 218 that he could place no reliance on those forms. And where we were left then on the evidence was that an unknown person at Saracen Alpen had filled in grossly inaccurate and misleading information which uh, was deceptive on the face of the form and which appeared to be wildly exaggerated. And the learned judge was entirely justified on this basis alone in reaching his conclusion, but this was a deliberate failure to comply with the rules, uh, which is his uh, finding of paragraph 305. Judgment. Uh, to comply with which rule? The client classification right. rules. The, uh, the need for determination. Determination after analysis. Now, this wasn't, in fact, the only extent of the potentially relevant client classification material the judge looked at. What he, in fact, did, in, in total fairness to my learned friend's client, 
was conduct a painstaking analysis of the other material that the defendant said they relied on, which might have been relevant to client classification. Uh, these included client profiles which had been created in June by the first defendant, which the judge said uh, held in paragraphs 94 and 95 were also inaccurate in material respects. Judge records at 95, satisfied in the evidence I've given which I later found that that information was incorrect in material respects. Mm -hmm. And I, I said the judge conducted a painstaking analysis. That is the analysis you see at, that starts at paragraph 243, where the judge says it's necessary, therefore, to consider whether Saracen and Alpen can establish on the basis of the other submissions advanced. Uh, that before accepting Mr. Al Kharafi and Mrs. Al Khamadi's clients in June 2007, it had determined, and so on. And that analysis goes all the way through to paragraph 251, where he comprehensively analyzes the information which Saras and Alpha might have tried to pray, pray and aid. And then he summarized the position at paragraph 251 entirely fairly, and I would just invite my lords to remind them, His Excellency, to remind themselves of paragraph 251. Then, that's the submission. Well, sorry, that's the uh, Mr. Warriors. Well, that's that his sort of, his sort of uh, boiling down, as it were, yeah. of, what, of what was being said. And just on that, before I go to the next paragraph, one needs to keep in mind that the uh, that the uh, client profiles that are referred to are the ones he's already found are inaccurate at paragraph 95, and one needs to also keep in mind that the uh, research using publicly available sources has been dealt with a paragraph 250, which showed some very uh, incomplete and limited information available from a, in, a in a memorandum said to have been compiled from publicly available sources. The judge then at paragraph 252 concluded he didn't get anything out of the discussions of Mr. Cheerion that we relied on. And at paragraph 253, the judge addressed the cross-examination of Mr. Walia with regard to how Saracen Alpen could possibly have satisfied itself uh, about the experience and understanding of Mrs. Al-Hamad, who, and of course, as was clear from that, uh, I invite my lawyers to read it, but it is clear from it, from Mrs. Mr. Wally's cross-examination, they were in real difficulties because they'd never met her. first case was it still to be found in the AGBCs, even though they had been filled in by Saras and Halpin. I think that well, was even assuming they had been filled in by the client. That is information upon which a determination yeah. could be made. 
Yes. So it can't be the determination. No, I agree. So, and, and I'm, of course, this may be pedantic, but there's a requirement to keep a record of the analysis and the determination. There isn't one. Yes. So where where is the determination said to be found? Well, uh, it may be they would rely on the document called the client profile, which is the document which is uh, the judge criticised at paragraph 95. Right. One of our submissions is the whole process was completely inadequate and there was not a proper process and proper record keeping to show any proper process determination. Right. My learned friend says, well, that's just a criticism of breach of um, three, two, four, or five, five or six of the rules. But I say it's actually relevant to whether there was any analysis. There's no complaint about bias, as I understand it, but yeah. all I'm seeing is where, 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 does, where does Mr. Warrior say that when did the determination take place and in what form? I don't want to put words into Mr. Warrior or Mr. Brindle's mouth because my case was that it never happened and there wasn't one. And no. my case and my submission was borne out by the evidence. Uh, and so in all those circumstances, the conclusion the judge reaches, which is a paragraph 254, was absolutely right. In my view, what the judge says is, in my view, Mr. Gwalia's evidence provides no basis upon which it could be held that before accepting Mr. al Kharafi and Mrs. al Hamad as clients in June 2007, Saracen Halpern had taken steps necessary to determine that they or I were them one, had at least one million in liquid assets, and two, had sufficient financial experience and understanding to participate in financial markets. And that was a conclusion he reached after very careful analysis, and in fact being charitable in my submission to my learned friend's client about what information they could possibly pray in aid. <coughs> and just to summarize five points that uh, justify that conclusion, first, uh, the most crucial document, the AGBCs, had been filled in after signature and with false and deceptive information. Secondly, uh, my, my Lord's point, the information had been filled in in the first person to give the impression the claimants were doing it. Thirdly, the client profiles were inaccurate in, ma in, in material respects, as the judge found in paragraph 95. Fourthly, the other information relied on was gone through by the judge and was obviously inadequate to establish any uh, proper process of analysis or any uh, <coughs> satisfactory evidence of the wealth and experience qualification. Fifthly, uh, in relation to C2, and I'll come to C3 in a minute, it was impossible to imagine, and Mr. Wilder couldn't assist at all, how any view could ever have been reached or any process gone through to satisfy themselves that she had the experience and understanding. They had never met her. So that, in my submission, is an entirely sound finding. And the judge then, again, very carefully, did the same exercise in relation to C3, which you see at paragraph 255, starts at paragraph 255, where the, the judge summarizes Mr. Brindle's client's case. Uh, he made the point at 256 that, as he's held, they can't rely on the AGBCs. And then he very fairly went through the evidence at 257 and 258 and 259 to look at the other material, including the witness statement evidence at 258 and the cross-examination at 259. Uh, and... Uh, this was another instance where the client profile was inaccurate and another instance where the defendants had never met the third claimant, just as they had never met the second claimant. And one needs to look at perhaps paragraph 259. When it was put to him, there was no basis for Saracen Alpen to think that Mrs. Al Rafai had assets of 10 million Swiss francs. He answered, that's not right. The information would have come from Allah. There is no information which the bank is dreaming up by itself. But he accepted and answered the next question. He was not in a position to know where the information had come from, Mr. Taha. When asked where the suggestion recorded that she had more than 200 million investments had come from, he answered, I wouldn't know. 
And so the judge's conclusion at paragraph 260, again in relation to her, reached after careful analysis and uh, entirely right. No basis could be held that before accepting Mrs. Arafai as a client, Senator so <coughs> had taken steps necessary to determine she had at least one million in liquid assets. Nor, so far as relevant, had Saracen Alpen taken steps to determine she had sufficient financial experience and understanding to participate in financial markets. Uh, and that consequence of that, as the judge explained in paragraphs 261 and 262, was that the claimants had to be treated as retail clients. And that meant Saracen Alpen couldn't do business with them at all, as the judge made clear at 262. Now, uh, although not particularly critical to the judge's reasoning at this, on this point, the judge did also express his concerns about a file note that was dated, this is the back dating, a file note dated 31st of May 2007 from Mr. Nair. And that's dealt with a paragraph 94 of the judgment. The judge's concern, which in my submission was well-founded, was that the document uh, referred to account numbers, but the account had not even been opened. Mr. Brindle went to the relevant part of the transcript of Mr. Wiley's evidence in his uh, opening submissions. Yeah. And my lords are going to be reading that again anyway. I'm not going to go back to it, but in my submission... The well, that's all along the lines, that uh, an account number before the account is open. That's what he sort of ended up yeah. saying. I'm going to invite my lord, when you look at it again, to look through what he actually said. What he actually says is a bit of a variety of explanations, which sort of ends up with the position as just summarised by, by my lord. But uh, in my but, I mean, submission... Apart from what I call, I suppose, some aspect of credit, what's this backdating point going to? Well, my submission is it doesn't go to a huge amount. And indeed, even in the judgment, it doesn't go to a huge amount. Right. My learned friend makes a lot of it on this appeal, because what he's trying to say is the whole, all of the judge's findings are in some way infected by unfairness, and an example of, his, of this unfairness is his approach to the backdate. Well, that's completely wrong. You can see the judge's reasoning on all the key parts of the case, and they're nothing to do with, I find this because he backdated a document. But he does, in fact, find this backdating, and in my submission, the finding he makes as it happens, is entirely fair and open to him. And when you read Mr. Wiley's evidence, the transcript of his evidence, he did uh, appear, and the judge, in my submission, rightly found, to be making it up as he went along. Just and then, give me the cross-reference on me. Yeah, I, I knew you were going to ask you that. <laughs> D253, I think. Yes. Have a, have a note in my notes to get it. Thank you. But uh, we will get that. So as I say, it is a small point, although my learned friend tries to make a lot of it, but insofar as the point goes, the judge was justified on the material he had to disbelieve Mr. Mr. Wallier. He appeared to be making it up, and it was a rather unconvincing explanation. Uh, and as I say, it's not the only example of uh, curious dating in the document and we've just seen an example, about 6th of June date for the counter signature on the AGBCs. So, well, that's the factual background and the judge's finding that the judge had not properly complied with their obligations. And against that background, I'll now address the, the grounds of appeal. The first point made uh, related to whether Saracen Alpen could, contrary to the judge's finding, rely on the filled-in AGBCs and the information in the AGBCs. And uh, the judge's finding that he couldn't rely on them was entirely justified in my submission. It was uh, not just that they were returned blank, although that was a very important point. It was also that they had been uh, 
filled in in a misleading way to suggest they've been written by the claimant, and the information on them was itself incorrect and misleading, and there was no reliable explanation other than pure speculation about how the document came to be prepared or what the basis for the information was. And that's exactly what the judge has found, all of those points. Well, I'll give you the references. It's 188 to 191 and 214 to 8 of the judgment. And in, in relation to the misleading authoring, that's paragraph 304. In relation to the inaccurate information, it's, two, it's, it's judgment paragraph 276. Now, what I, mean, I know Mr. Riddle didn't like my noun, but it is a forgery. Well, I'd say so, yes. Yes. Uh, it, it purports to be a document filled in by the person who signed it, when in fact it's been filled in by someone else. Yes. Yes. Well, yes. And the attempt to say, well, it's all an innocent explanation, the sort of thing that happens all the time, is really belied by the way in which the document was later used against us in those pre-action correspondence to say we have filled them in. Yeah. Now the technique on this appeal that went learned friend is to focus on paragraphs 234 and 235 of the judgment. As if that encapsulates the only part of a judge's reasoning. But what they've done is actually ignored the very extensive and careful analysis the judge in fact gave, which I have just been through uh, in the judgment. And uh, in relation to the AGBC, what the judgment was saying in substance was that Saracen couldn't pull itself up by its bootstraps using false information on the form which some unidentified person had put in in unexplained circumstances. Now, there's a very small point then made at paragraph 68 of my learned friend Skeleton, which I'm not sure he's pursuing, which is to the effect that the judge didn't explain the reasoning for his conclusion. Uh, that is, if it's pursued, a very strange reading of the judgment. It's a submission that one could only be made if one ignores paragraphs 188 to 191, 214 to 218, 267 to 276, and 304 of the judgment. Uh, the next point made is the criticism which is, which is renewed orally, uh, essentially saying that the uh, information, essentially criticising paragraph, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll start that again. Uh, the, the point made is that the information came from Mr. the claimant or Mr. Taha, and the judge is criticised for not addressing that or accepting that. But in fact, Mr. Taha denied it had come from him, as I said, and he wasn't cross-examined, and the judge addressed that at paragraphs 188 to 191 of his judgment. And as the judge also recorded there, Mr. Walia, in his cross-examination, in fact had no support for his speculation as to where the information on the forms had come from. So it's an unfair criticism of the judge. Uh, Malone Friend also sought to say, and I think he rather downplayed it orally, that the information on the AGBCs was substantially correct. Well, it palpably wasn't. We've been, we've been to the forms. They were grossly incorrect. And the judge, uh, as I say, set out the errors as listed in, in our evidence, which he accepted. <coughs> so the, there's a submission of paragraph 69 of my learned friend's skeleton argument. You don't need to turn it up, but just for the transcript. All the criticisms made in that paragraph are entirely unfair and contrary to the act both the evidence and the judgment. The uh, next point for my learned friend is a more technical point, which is that the contract in the AGBCs is a contract in the terms of the completed documents, even though the claimants didn't complete them. This is a sort of Alice in Wonderland submission, that the idea is that if the claimant signed them and sent them, black, sent them in blank, then whatever information Saracen Alpham chose to put in on the form represented the contractual binding form of the agreement between them. The proposition only needs to be said to be 
seen as absurd, and I'm not going to spend any further time on that. Uh, my learned friend then made, uh, in my submission, another bad point, which is also at paragraphs 70, and 74, 70 to 74 of his skeleton, that because the form as a whole was signed, this must have constituted a ticking of the box and a ticking of the correct box. So what's said is, I think the way it's put is, the other boxes are less likely to apply. So you've got to find the box that most likely is applying to them, and then deem that as ticked. Uh, but the judge considered that argument and rightly rejected it at paragraph 242 of the judgment. says is I reject the submission made on half a certain album, but the fact that uh, neither of neither Ms. Alice al Karabi nor Ms. al Hamad ticked any of the boxes under paragraph one and one is irrelevant. In particular I do not accept submission that on any view he she was declaring by next one that he was a client by one of the definitions of client contained in COD. The true analysis is that in the circumstances signatory ticked none of the boxes under paragraph one of Annex A he or she cannot be taken to have made any declaration under that paragraph one. The position is the same insofar as Savage now proceeds to rely on the declaration in paragraph one of Annex one of the ADBC's advanced submission set out in some paragraph four of the previous paragraphs. That's a bit Delphic. That is a reference to the separate independent consent requirement. Yeah. And what the judge says is Savage now can rely on paragraph seven of Annex one. And, my Lord, in these submissions, uh, we say the judge got it right. If one picks up Annex 1, yeah. uh, one can see that in relation to paragraph 1, there's a representation of warranty, I mean definition of client, as follows. If that's left blank, even as a matter of construction, before you consider the regulatory framework, they're not making any identification of uh, meeting any particular client box or client requirement. And it's not open for the recipient to say, well, you probably correspond best to one of these boxes and I'm going to tip that. Well, not even if this is construed against the factual matrix, where um, uh, both sides and an independent objective for observer would know something about these um, clients. I would know, because what one has to remember, this is part of a regulatory process of establishing, to help the firm conduct an analysis, of establishing what it is their uh, qualifications and aspects of them are. You can't short circuit it by saying, well, as long as you sign the form, I need to deem what I think on the matrix is the best box ticked, and I need to essentially bypass that part of the analysis process. Well, that's a separate point, it seems to me, as to whether or not the document should be construed with a tick in the box. The fact that there's a tick in the box may not mean that the rules have been complied with. So I'm just dealing with your submission. But this can't be construed as having a tick in the box. Well, Lord, uh, I, I accept that there's a regulatory aspect and a contractual aspect. In my submission, it probably isn't right to divorce the two entirely when one looking, one's looking as a matter of construction at a document that is only there for a regulatory purpose, then you can't read someone saying, representing and warranting, that they uh, meet a definition as follows without saying any, giving any further information about how they meet the definition as being a declaration that they meet any particular definition. And you can't substitute for as follows some some other persons, in this case the banks, guess uh, what they meant by as follows. 
But what the judge is also finding, and we, we don't appeal, is at paragraph 7, they are consenting to being treated as a client. So in terms of the separate requirement under the rules of consent, they have signed this document, and that does contain their consent. But well, also, but one needs to keep in mind... Consent to being treated as a client if they are a client. Well, yes. One needs to keep in mind that there are these separate uh, limbs. They need to be classified as a client by the firm after the process of analysis, and they need to consent. The other point about my, learned, my Lord Sir Richard Field's questions about the contract, is it doesn't really take uh, my learned friend anywhere. And this is the point I'm going to come back to on contractual estoppel. The obligation under the rules is on the firm to conduct a process of analysis and confirm that the client is indeed a client. You can't contractually short circuit or bypass that obligation under the rules. So while there are these quite interesting debates before my Lord about whether Clause 1 as a matter of construction could be deemed a tip or indeed whether contractual estoppel otherwise arises, that's all a bit of a moot, because it's not addressing what the judge has found, which is there is a regulatory obligation to conduct a process of analysis. That regulatory obligation was not complied with, and that's got what gives rise to the obligation to, to give compensation. Um, now, uh, What we also say, uh, a more minor point, is that rather than the non-ticking of the box being accepted by Bank Sar by Saris and Alquin as deeming some form of ticking of the box, what in fact should have happened as a matter of practice and regulatory, what's obvious from a regulatory perspective, is the opposite. Alarm bell should have been rung. They should have said, look, these people who want to be, who profess to be or, or who can only be qualified if they are uh, not retail clients, have sent us back a form. They haven't even filled in the details. We're, the chances are, being Arabic speakers, they haven't read it. We'd better meet them, meet all three of them, and make sure they qualify, which is quite the opposite of the submission my learned friend is advancing on the basis of that form. So in, in my submission, you, you can't get there as a matter of construction or implication, but in any event, as I've just submitted, it all misses the point, which is this is a regulatory point which requires an analysis by the firm, and there's nothing here that assists in that analysis or can form an legitimate part of it. Uh, and the same goes to paragraph 7 of the form, which I'm coming to now, because my learned friend really repeats this submission by reference to paragraph 7, which he says is itself sufficient to qualify the claimants as clients, and that, again, in my submission, just doesn't work. Uh, again, the firm's analysis and verification process is independent of the client's consent under the rules. Paragraph 7, on its proper construction, only goes to the consent question, as the judge held at paragraph 242, and those are separate and cumulative requirements. And the reason for that is obvious, and indeed was explored in submission by, by my lords, with, with Mr. Brindle. Because otherwise every client, however poor and inexperienced, if foolish enough, would just self-certify by signature and the firm wouldn't have any obligation at all. But that is the antithesis of what the rules provide for, which is a process of analysis and determination by the firm. So the firm has to undertake, on any view, an analysis under the rules and as the judge found at paragraphs 254 and 261 uh, of his judgment, uh, they didn't do so. Uh, the conclusion of paragraph 261 is I conclude that Saris and Alpin failed to carry out any or any sufficient investigation in order to satisfy itself the criteria were met. And uh, 
also worth having in mind paragraph 325 of the judgment when the judge comes back to the same point. Now that brings me to the contractual estoppel point at ground 2-2, which is a very similar point. Uh, it's, it's first said the, judgment, the judge didn't deal with contractual estoppel, or he did. Uh, if, if, if I always keep a finger in 325, because we're about to go to it. In, in fact, at 242, the judge does in fact address I'm sorry, I, but I didn't realise. Things have moved on. My learned friend accepts he did deal with it. So it's at the the in what looks like the wrong place, but nothing so. Yes. So it's in at 325. I also, as it happens, it's now a non-point. It's actually in there at 242 as well, in the right place. So it's in there, it's in there twice, but spelled out more fully at 325. Uh, the next point is, uh, well, the judge r rightly makes the point in in th paragraph 325 but the rules don't permit a client to contract out and as I s just submitted one needs an analysis uh, and uh, it, I, I, I've made the point that otherwise it would uh, render otios the first provisions of the rules which, which specifically require analysis you can't bypass the analysis requirement just by ticking the consent so to summarise on contractual estoppel we really make four points. First, the firm has to determine as a matter of principle uh, whether the client is indeed a client after analysis. And as a matter of principle, the firm cannot relieve itself of its regulatory obligation to do that. Secondly, the rules themselves require the determination and analysis process uh, separately from the question of consent. You can only accept the client after analysis. Uh, thirdly, on the facts, in any event, there couldn't be a contractual estoppel. None of them, in fact, contractually agreed that they qualified as a client because the box was unticked and Annex 1 was blank. And as regards my learned friend's point on paragraph 7, consenting to being treated as a client, and indeed even as he relies, declare and, con de declare and further consent to being treated as a client, does not itself amount to a declaration for the purposes of contractual estoppel that they qualified as a client by meeting the wealth and experience test. That's not what the words say. It's difficult, in fact, to construe what the words say, but all they say is declare and further consent to being treated as a client under the laws and regulations of the IFC and confirm I understand by making mistake when you can actually not to be afforded the retail customer protection. So it's, it has got the word declare in, which is a bit odd, but the rest of it is a fairly vanilla consent provision and it's not making any declaration with regard to their qualification on wealth or their qualification on experience or understanding. The fourth point is that you don't, and I say you don't get this far, but if you did, uh, one would not apply contractual estoppel in circumstances such as these where the effect of the clause was not explained to them, and no one suggests it was, and where the clients were in fact retail investors and not clients for this wholesale jurisdiction uh, as the judge found in paragraph 325 and where they were financially unsophisticated and not given fair warning. Now, there is authority on that point, which we've referred to in paragraphs 275.6 and 275.7 of our skeleton, which is the Singaporean Court of Appeal. Oh, I'll give my order to reference in a minute. I'm not going to, to take time on that now in terms of going to the authority, but uh, essentially it... The, the proposition is that when one has consumer retail protection, one doesn't apply principles of contractual estoppel in the 
harshest terms as perhaps uh, might be said in the spring world ones. And uh, we say the way my learned friend obviously relies heavily on Springwell. Springwell doesn't help him for, for three reasons. First, because there isn't a clear declaration to found in the stopper, as I've explained. Secondly, because Springwell isn't addressing the retail consumer protection question. It wasn't a consumer protection case. The only cases that do address it are the Singaporean Court of Appeal cases that I've uh, referred to, and they have to be preferred. So the authority... One, one court of appeal case, one high court. The authority is volume 6, tabs 45 and 46. So uh, this is my second point. Uh, the, court, the court of appeal in Singapore has rightly identified that consumer protection is an area where it would not be appropriate to apply the contractual estoppel do doctrine. Thirdly, my, that's my most important point, none of this helps a learned friend because there's still a breach of the rule. Contractual estoppel doesn't mean there's no breach of the rules because they can't be contracted out of and they have a regulatory obligation. And the rules mean what they say and they were breached in this case. And that's what the judgment and the compensation claim <coughs> awarded feeds from. So, my Lord, there's nothing in my learned friend's arguments on those points. Uh, I think I've just made this point, so I'll pass over it. Yes, but I, one point, this is raised in paragraph 78.2 of my learned friend Skeleton, is that we, he suggests that we might be suggesting in some way that the investor and the information he gives on the form couldn't be one legitimate source of information for the firm to take into account. But of course that's right, that's what the form is there for, but it depends what the investor puts on the form. The investor puts nothing on the form other than his signature as in this case, it's not giving anything for the firm in terms of the information they need to conduct the client classification exercise. Uh, and the last point I think taken on this area by my learned friend is the suggestion that one doesn't need to be worried about the retail protection element for three reasons. First, he says, because the client isn't yet the client. Well, that's a, 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 an absurd proposition. This is about the process of determining whether he is going to qualify as a client and, and end up being stripped of the retail protections that he would otherwise have in a retail jurisdiction. So it is still protection for the retail consumer. That's what this is all about. Secondly, my learned friend says, you don't need to worry because a wholesale client does get some protections. But again, the whole point of the client classification requirement is that the protections for a wholesale client, when there is not a retail client jurisdiction, are much more limited protections, excluding suitability and so on. Uh, so this is all about the more limited retail protections. You can't sweep the point away by saying you don't need to worry because there are some protections even for wholesale clients. The third point made is, uh, and I learned a friend made this quite forcefully, he said, why protect people who have made a free choice? But the point of the rules is to uh, require not only a consent requirement, but a policing of the consent requirement. And that is why one has the analysis after determination. So free choice and consent are not the point. That is just one of the three of the cumulative requirements, and it's obvious why. Uh, my learned friend then, in relation to that last point, made, Doug did make some arguments which didn't really take us anywhere about the, what the consent requirement was all about. And he suggested it was in some way to be seen as an opt-out. It was, it was related to uh, a, an option of being treated as a retail client if you're a wholesale client. Now, th this all was a little bit in reverse because the option of being a wholesale client or a retail client didn't arise until later when the DIFC became a retail as well as a wholesale jurisdiction. And it's right to say that under the new rules, 
No, but it, there are both jurisdictions, but, but, but both formats here. There is an opt-out, so even a wholesale client can elect to be a retail client. But that doesn't arise in relation to these rules, because the, the retail option have not yet come in. So what my learned friend, although the submission very elegantly put, but what they actually came down to is this is just a consent requirement. If you don't consent, you can't be a client, which is exactly what the rules say. So there's nothing, you can't sort of downplay or relegate the consent point as being some kind of option. It is a requirement of consent, uh, that's, uh, which is, just means what it says. Uh, my, my learned friend then had his, what he called his grand 2.3, which is his alleged error of law in Mrs. Al Rafai's client classification. And that was in their skeleton at paragraph 81, dealt with, our, dealt with in our skeleton at paragraphs 276 to 280. Uh, and uh, there isn't really a point here, I probably need to come back to this, but uh, the judge in fact decided that the advice given to Mrs. Al Rafai was specific advice, uh, and he also decided that she didn't have uh, she did not have one million in, in liquid assets. So I'll, I'll come back to that one, but there's, there's nothing in that ground. Then there was ground 2.4, which is my learned friend's big attack on the learned judge's findings that they were not clients. <coughs> and uh, this obviously arises because the judge, learned judge rightly held that uh, it wasn't enough for us to get home if we established they hadn't properly classify them as clients if, in fact, they would have qualified as clients. Otherwise, it's a technical breach with no causative consequence. And that's the judge's approach. So the, the, the critical to that was his follow-up conclusions that the clients wouldn't have qualified. My, my, claimants would, my clients would not have qualified as clients for regulatory purposes. Now, on that point, uh, my learned friend started off... Now, whether yes. they would have qualified. Whether they would have, exactly, whether they would have qualified. And my learned friend essentially says the judge was wrong uh, to say that they wouldn't have qualified. Now, uh, the first point my learned friend makes is that the judge applied the wrong test. What he says is the judge was considering the claimant's experience in these types of investment rather than the claimant's experience and understanding of financial markets generally. And this is the point we've already spent some time on this morning. In fact, even if Melinda and Friend were right about the test, he's not right about the judgment, because it's a misreading of the judgment. What the judge, in fact, decided was that the claimants were inexperienced investors generally. We've uh, cited in paragraph 283 of our skeleton argument all the, all the relevant passages of the judgment. And uh, in addition to, the, to those passages, one needs to look at all of paragraphs 272 to 276 of the judgment. Where the judge uh, considered carefully the evidence to the effect that none of the claimants were experienced in financial markets and that Mr. Al -Hamad, Mrs. Al Hamad and Mrs. Al Rafai were inexperienced investors. And one can see him conducting that exercise from 272 through 274, 275 uh, before accepting the uh, evidence at 276 and reaching his conclusion at 276. should have said 267 through to 276. So what the judge in fact finds is they uh, are inexperienced investors. Mr. al Kharafi did not have significant experience in financial markets that's t and that, uh, and that uh, <coughs> 
Mrs. Al Hamad and Mrs. Al Rafai were inexperienced investors. And that's the, the summary at 272, which is accepted essentially at paragraph 276. So even on my learned friend's test, he doesn't get home because the judge actually found they were simple, sim simply inexperienced investors in the financial markets. But in any event, he was applying the wrong test uh, because uh, my learned friends are ignoring uh, conduct of business rules 3.2.4, which we went to this morning, which do make it clear in my submission, but on any view, one needs to be considering relevant financial markets including those relevant to the proposed transaction. And there's also the point, it's perhaps a more minor point, but it is still a significant point raised by my Lord Sir Richard Field, that even looking at the first rule of COP 3.2.2, they, they have to have understanding such as to enable them to participate in the financial markets, which is again a relevant put part of the consideration. So well, that's the attack on the uh, qualification of the, the clients. Uh, there's then a pedantic point in my submission about whether the judge inserted a necessary steps test. Uh, but uh, th there's two points about whether the judge did insert a necessary steps. First, it's a perfectly sensible description for the judge to say we didn't take any necessary steps to, it, to determine or, and, or to analyse is a perfectly sensible description of what is required under the rules, which is a process of analysis and determination. So there's nothing in that point. But secondly, what the judge found, and it's clear at paragraph 261 of the judgment, is that the firm did not undertake any or any sufficient investigation. We found that it wasn't a process of investigation. So my learned friend the necessary steps point doesn't get him anywhere because the judge made it quite clear that even without inserting the words necessary steps, they just didn't undertake uh, the investigation. So, I mean, putting that point another way, if you just ask the question in the terms of the rules, did the firm determine after analysis that the clients met the wealth qualification and experience understanding qualification? Judges' findings are already found. They didn't comply with that rule. And uh, on this aspect, Malone Friend's submissions are, are a little delphic because I think he recognises, or I submit, he recognises how unattractive his submission is. What he's saying, or close to saying, is that as long as the firm says they're clients, determines they're clients, says they are, then you've done your process of determination and analysis for the purposes of the rules, which again is one of these self-fulfilling ideas, self-certifying ideas, which is absurd. What the rules are telling you to do is to do a process of, proper, an actual process of determination and analysis. And I know a friend can't say, well, it can be as vestigial and hopeless as the firm likes as long as it just says at the end, says at the end of whatever it is, yes, they're a client. Uh, and the other point about that submission for my learned friend is it sits badly with his own case at trial, which was accepted by the judge, but there's no contractual duty of care on the firm's part essentially in line with the regulations. We submitted that as well as being a regulatory duty, there was a contractual duty of care which, which matched the regulatory duty. So there was a duty in contract to comply with the rules. It was slightly unnecessary submission because we, that we had the regulatory entitlement anyway, but we did submit that. And that was um, rejected uh, on the basis that you don't need it because, and uh, in line with my learned friend's arguments, you don't need it because you've got the regulatory duty and the regulatory protection anyway. So that being their case, it's quite surprising to see the submission that on something like the client classification, you don't need any actual process of analysis or determination at all, because once you said they're a client, that somehow complies with 3.2.2. What's obviously required is a meaningful, substantive process of analysis, and the judge has found that didn't happen.
then the next point by Leonard Francis, short point, he suggested that there'd been some conflation by the judge with rules 3.25 and 3.26, which is verification of record keeping. Well, the rules are related, but the judge didn't conflate them. He was clearly addressing in his judgment whether the firm had made a determination after analysis, and his finding was that the firm had not, and that's dealt with in paragraph 290 of our skeleton. Uh, the, the next point uh, relates to the fact that uh, the claimants had never met the clients. Sorry, I started again. Yes, I started again. The defendants had never met my, my clients, uh, which the judge rightly described as a striking feature of the case, and that's paragraph 163 of the judgment. Uh, my learned friend uh, tries to, to attack that, but uh, there's a a few points that arise in relation to his attack on that. Uh, first, uh, while Mr. Al Harafi was said to be the agent of the first and second claimant, there were no powers of attorney in favour of the first defendant in this case, uh, which is an important consideration. And as one of the interventions from the judge that we saw yesterday in the transcripts uh, made clear, the books are full of examples of <coughs> children deceiving their parents. Not that this is this case, but one needs to test it against what their obligations are. And the agent cannot cloak himself with authority. Secondly, and this is the more important point, even assuming Mr. al Kharafi were in some respects an agent, he couldn't possibly have been an agent for the purposes of the firm establishing its client classification process. The firm didn't, couldn't look at Mr. al Kharafi's wealth or understanding. They needed to establish the experience and understanding of the clients. The clients are always the clients. So the agency argument doesn't help Malone and Friend. And it was on this point that Malone and Friend referred to the Zaid or Zaki case. Um, and this was, of course, a very different case. This was a case not about client, protect, client classification, but about suitability. And more crucially, this was a case about a joint account on which the family members had been named for succession purposes. Uh, just for your note, I, it's at paragraphs 19 and 20 of the Zaki judgment. But what is said... Uh, we get, 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 get. Volume 3. Yes, it's volume 3, tab 19, paragraphs 19 and 20, which is at 860, 861 of the bundle. So the critical point is paragraph 20. In September 2003, Mr. Zaid opened a joint account with Credit Suisse Geneva. The account was in the name not only of Mr. Zaid but also the claimants. Mrs. Aki accepts this was done at least in part for succession purposes. A reluctant daughter reluctant to accept that the circumstances where the family had no involvement in the operating account 
It seems likely the family related account holder for succession purposes. So that's the critical point there. And then going forward to paragraph 29 of the judgment. What the judge holds is these agreements were, as I have said, not only Mr. Zai, but also his wife and daughters. But it is clear that Mr. Zaki dealt only with Mr. Zai. At no stage did his wife and daughters assert a right to be consulted. They must have been aware that Mr. Zaki dealt only with Mr. Zai. They must therefore have let Mr. Zaki understand their consent to dealing only with Mr. Zai. Nevertheless, they remained clients of CSUK to whom the regular duties were owed. If, as far as CSUK had duties to ensure that the the clients were suitable for duty of his own to reach the payment. However, so that's the first point, it's about suitability. However, because Mr. Zai's wife and daughters allowed Mr. Zai to deal with Mr. Zaki on their behalf in every respect, I do not consider they can assert that what was suitable for him was not suitable for them. Again, that's the critical point. And then we'll read the rest of the paragraph. And so one can exactly see why this is a perfectly sensible reasoning in that case. If you've got a joint account, then although, and one person who is a joint signatory gives instructions on the account, then although there's a duty of suitability owing to both, to, to both clients, on a joint account, uh, one, could, one can't really do, other, do otherwise and say what's suitable for one, for the joint secretary who's calling all the shots, is suitable for both of them. That logic just doesn't work at all on this case. If the mother and the wife had left it to the first claim to deal with the whole matter of qualifying the clients, including the provision of information as to their particular circumstances. Would the first defendant have been entitled to receive such information as it may have obtained from the first claim uh, in respect of all three? It's hard to see how they could. I don't suggest, I'm not sure I go so far to suggest it would be impossible to construct a scenario. It's very hard to see how you could establish a client's financial understanding uh, and experience, perhaps experience, certainly not financial understanding, without meeting them. Yeah, I think at the very least. There's a sort of cultural element here of, uh, in, in Middle Eastern society, the expectation was that the son would handle these matters on behalf of his mother and his wife. And they would accept that he would be, in effect, their, their mouthpiece. Well, that is absolutely not right. That is the submission that my learned friend tried to advance, which got nowhere at trial. We didn't, in fact, pursue it at trial. And we were interested to see it come back. I don't know why my I didn't pursue it. Well, it, didn't, but it, it got rather squashed That's in the course of the trial. The, the problem was, it's just not how business is done here. Miss, Mrs. Al Rafai and Mrs. Al Hamal have other banks, as in fact, my learned friend's points, Credit Suisse and so on. They all meet the clients. There's no question of them not having contact and um, meeting and having direct con communication with your banker. So it's, there's no evidence of any practice, and the evidence was against there being any practice that you do not uh, meet. Uh, uh, the women folk in, because we're, uh, we're here in the Middle East. This, uh, the, uh, so in, in, in answer to my Lord's first question, uh, I mean, it's, I suppose it's possible you could imagine a scenario of somehow communicating their experience and understanding in a way that you could verify it had come from them directly and wasn't just the agent sort of saying it of his own accord in a way that couldn't be relied on. But it's extremely difficult to imagine any client classification process where they are not beating the clients. And certainly in this case, one, one is a million miles away from having any, from, from having any basis to, to uh, ascertain the wealth and the understanding and the experience qualification of Mrs. Al Rafai and Mrs. Al Hamad. And that's and obviously the proof of the pudding's in the eating, because you can see what they said about their experience and their wealth, and it was just wildly, wildly inaccurate.
Yes, my, my learned duty reminds me of paragraph 163 of the judgment, uh, where it's actually on the point I'm on, where the judge sa says it's a striking feature of the case, it's neither never met Mr. Boyle or Mr. Nair. Both Mrs. Alham and Mrs. Arafai presented as intelligent, educated, and emancipated women, well able to make their own decisions. Rejecting the suggestion that there was not any question to take on the show of graphing the issue of national affairs, and, and so on. And it's also worth, on that point, picking up uh, at D2, uh, day 5, page 77, sorry, t it's tab 55, page 77, 78. Because I explored this issue with Mr. Wardy. I said, starting at line 8, uh, there was no reason at all for you not to have met either Mrs. Alpha Mouse and Mrs. Alpha Fire, was there? I'm sorry, there was a question. No reason not to have met her or even spoken to her. No, like I said, Miss part of having lived in the Middle East for more than 20 odd years and having dealt with the Indian for the reason of similar size to geography, I've not met anybody's woman for two years, saying most of the 99 percent not. Question, that seems to be an assumption that you made on your case. I may have said part, but certainly your case. But you had no reason to believe that in this case, with these clients, any cultural sensitivity would prevent you from meeting her. Uh, like I said, I, having dealt with a number of Arab clients, we don't ask. It's not the right thing to do. If somebody wants to meet us, they would meet us. But we don't ask. I'm sorry, that's the reality of life here. Question, you didn't make any inquiries to whether there would be any cultural issues with meeting her. Answer, no, I did not. We have all seen Mrs. Allen, and it's quite obvious that you would have been, wouldn't have been any problem with meeting her, was there, correct? Indeed, her other banking advisors did meet her, correct? So no cultural issue at all for you not to have met her related to divorce investment. No, I completely agree with you. I'm oh, sorry, yes, but I don't know what's been written on. goes to line 12 of page 79, question and answer there. Seems to be saying it's all right to have Mr. Karaki just acting informally, without any power of attorney. No, I'm not saying that. That's what he was doing. That's what we were accepting. He's the son, she's the mother. It's like me. I've been active for my mother for the last 30 odd years. I don't have a power of attorney. But uh, uh, I'll do what is correct for her and what is not. I'll run her bank accounts. My father died 30 years ago. So that, has, that passage, in fact, shows it's another example, leaving aside the qualities of Mr. Wiley's evidence, what it showed was at the very best, just uh, some sort of uh, uh, speculation or assumption on their part, and no basis for uh, not meeting the client, as indeed Mr. Wiley accepted that passage. Uh, my Lord, I'm conscious is quite dense stuff. I wonder if it's perhaps a convenient moment to <laughs> take a break. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> We'll take a break. All rise.